While the First World War was started in Europe with the assassination of an Austrian archduke, the seeds of British involvement actually began in 1839. As the independence of Belgium took shape, the majority of global powers of the time attempted to diplomatically keep the balance of power in Europe by making the new nation neutral, thus in no nation's sphere of influence. As the decades passed on, the European balance of power was always shifting. The Belgium maintained its neutrality as part of a condition of her independence. Under King Leopold, the same Belgian nation in 1870 and 1880s famously sent explorers and expeditions to claim large swathes of the African Congo. Once again, this shifted the balance of power in Europe. A minor state of 30,000 kilometers now controlled a colony of millions of kilometers. Various nations had already claimed the area, just hadn't they? exercised any occupation of the overseas possession. Not to be outdone by the upstart neighbor, Bismarck, Chancellor of the German Empire, hosted the Berlin Conference in 1884. The consequence of this conference was the Berlin Act of 1885. It was agreed that colonies on the east coast of Africa were to remain neutral in times of European conflict. These agreements were still being upheld in 1914, when the German Empire asked for neutral Belgium to give the German military access in order to invade the French Republic on the 3rd of August, 1914. Refusing military access to the German Empire in an effort to remain neutral, German forces invaded neutral Belgium anyways. On the 3rd of August, the Belgian government appealed to the British Empire to intervene against the invading German forces. In keeping with the Treaty of 1839, Britain asked for the German army to vacate Belgium lands. Refusing so, on the 4th of August, Britain declared war on Germany. On the 5th of August, various meetings were held with the pretext of protecting British shipping around the globe to the island nation. Plans were made to invade Germany's colonial possessions. On the same day in East Africa, many hoped their pieces of paper would yet deter conflict from spreading to their colonies, while others made moves. Magadi Soda Company sounds like a fizzy drink maker, but the area today still is one of the world's largest producers of soda ash. Soda ash is used to make detergent, soap, and borax cleaning products. The Ugandan Railroad actually connects the Magadi Rail Line, placing it in between the railroad and the German base of operations at Longidu. On the outbreak of war, Guy Simmons, the manager of the Magadi Soda Company, traveled to Nairobi at the outbreak of war and met Lieutenant Colonel Ward. Lieutenant Colonel Ward at Nairobi ordered two things. First, the rolling stock of railroad engines and carts were to be made at the military's disposal. The second, the topic of today's video, the raising of the Magadi Defense Force. Guy Simmons mailed a letter to the Magadi Soda Company owner, Mr. Samuel, about what Lieutenant Colonel Ward had ordered. The Magadi Soda Company didn't fight the military and made its rail stocks and eight individuals available right away to the military. These eight men elected Guy Simmons to be their commanding officer. On the official rolls, Nairobi knew this unit as the Magadi Railroad Volunteers, but they would refer to themselves in the field and others would know the unit as the Magadi Defense Force. The original batch were eight in total. They included a railroad guard, a chemist, an accountant, a builder, and a farmer, and a big game hunter. The unit would only reach a height of 20 men in total. Their military mission was to patrol the area around the Magadi Railroad and be on the lookout for German forces. They set up a pair of lookout signal stations, as well as maintaining a sweeping mounted patrol. The same day as the East African Mounted Rifles arrived to bolster the area's military forces, the 24th of August, the Magadi Defense Force reported to Nairobi the Germans were building a base at Longidu. 57-year-old Governor Belfield of British East Africa had a military force of around 2,400 King's African Rifles, Officers, and Askaris, plus local commission police Askaris. These troops had a military mission of security, a mixed duty of keeping the locals from engaging in violence and anti-theft patrols. A single company of the King's African Rifles was stationed in Nairobi, carried out these duties, but as well as carried out ceremonial details. Governor Belfield hadn't increased the colony's military might since coming in 1912, but his tenure up to that point hadn't really warranted it. He had wanted to review the colony's military capabilities in July 1914, but later changed his mind when the commanding officer of the 3rd Battalion King's African Rifles was absent on leave. 
On the 5th of August, Governor Belfield declared the colony under martial law. Even after learning the British government was planning to invade German East Africa, he encouraged it, but busied himself with other affairs, organizing the hundreds of settlers flooding into Nairobi to enlist in the conflict were left to their own devices. The British military commanding officer at the outbreak of conflict was Lieutenant Colonel Ward of the 4th Battalion King's African Rifles. Anticipating conflict with Germany, he had made it a military appreciation of the colony's defenses and was able to signify the importance of the Ugandan Railroad that stretched across British East Africa and Uganda. On the outbreak of war, he was found to be the highest ranking officer in both Uganda and British East Africa's colonies. Assuming command on the 5th of August, he immediately redeployed troops from across the colonies to concentrate on Nairobi and build an improvised headquarters staff, stripping the colony of the regular troops to redeploy them to vital areas along the railroad. He replaced them with newly raised units popping up to internal security and drilling. He placed emphasis on defense and depth and the importance of protecting the Ugandan Railroad. Opposite Governor Belfield, German Governor Schnee. Schnee had been active in Germany's colonial politics for quite some time before taking up the governorship of German East Africa in 1912. He oversaw the colony's economics, which had been operating at a deficit. While the colony was vast, it was importing around 2.5 million pounds sterling while only exporting 1.7 million pounds sterling worth of goods. Germany accounted for consuming 1 million pounds sterling worth of exports. The two main goods imported were clothing and rice, costing the colony around 1. million pounds sterling. Governor Schnee had a similar security force to that of British East Africa. Around 2,700 men made up of German officers and African Ascaris in the German Schutztruppe. He hadn't been taking actions to increase this force or build up any coastal defenses, instead hoping the British would adhere to the Berlin Act of 1885. In the opening days of war, he relegated internal military matters to his military right-hand man, Paul von Leto Vorbrich. His position of wanting to adhere to the Berlin Act and be a loyal German officer were sometimes at odds. Take the 8th of August, 1914, for example. The capital of German East Africa was Der Es Salam, meaning Haven of Peace. The capital had had her harbor entrance obstructed to ocean access with German scuttled vessels, thus blocking any navy using the harbor to make war. That didn't stop the British from shelling the city's rail station and wireless radio mast by the HMS Astria. The shelling was reported to have done minimal damage, but Governor Schnee ordered the wireless radio mast destroyed and negotiated with the British vessel's captain, Captain Sykes. The negotiations asked the Germans to refrain from any hostile acts, but after the British left, Governor Schnee had the radio mast reassembled, but disguised it this time as a tropical palm tree in order to report the situation to Berlin. If Governor Schnee was mired with following international law, Paul von Leto Vorbrück was mired with a warrior's heart. Initially, he had been offered the command of German Cameroon, but turned down the post. Having fought several uprisings in China and Southwest Africa, and later serving in various German army regimental staffs, Vorbrück applied for a position in the German Colonial Command after a career spanning 24 years prior to 1914. In January 1914, he finally takes command of the German East African Schutztruppe after arriving in Der es Salaam. He immediately took to touring the country and vigorously inspecting all of his command posts. Impressed by all their doctrine and discipline, he immediately went on to refit his men with modern smokeless rifles as best he could. Also, he took the time to inspect various police units and European shooting clubs. He also had an occasion to interact with various local tribesmen. All of these would help him at the outbreak of war. After the events of August 8th, Vorbrook took a column of German Ascaris to repel a suspected British landing at Dar es Salaam. Seeing the British vessels off the coast, he sent a German officer ahead. While the British had actually landed and then retired back, the news the German officers returned with was even more grave. The officer reported the British had landed, 
and negotiated with Governor Schnee, had himself blown up the wireless radio mast. From that point forward, Vorbrick would make every attempt to exclude the governor from military planning, despite the governor ranking higher than Vorbrick. Britain declared war on Germany on the night of the 4th of August 1914, following the German invasion of neutral Belgium. And on the 5th of August 1914, a recruitment office was opened for the enlistment of eager men to defend the colony of British East Africa. With patriotic fever, various groups and people rushed the capital to do their part in the war effort. Governor Belfield, wanting to ignore the military situation, led to a multitude of various small units forming and being abandoned by the colonial administration. Many went home, but those that stayed formed new units of various sizes of their own volition. The military situation found in East Africa by Lieutenant Colonel Ward saw these random-sized units quickly sent into the field. The most famous of these hopeful units was the East African Mounted Rifles. Formerly organized to be comprised of six squadrons of horse, a machine gun, and signal section, the unit never attained this large size, but rather was initially formed from various other units, notably Boker's Horse, Cole's Scouts, and Monica's own Lancers, etc. At its highest, the unit only ever reached 400 active members, and the unit rarely operated as a single fighting force. Its military mission was only meant for colonial defense, despite one of its officers offering to invade German East Africa by himself. Squadron A, Monica's own Lancers, were under Captain A.K. O'Brien. These men were formed under arms of lances and hunting rifles. The unit was named after the governor's daughter and made up of Nairobi men some having membership in the Legion of the Frontiersmen. Captain O'Brien was convinced his lances would cause the German Ascaris terror. Luckily, after the 15th of August parade, these lances never saw combat. Leaving Nairobi on the 8th of September, they made for Kijido. On the 12th of August 1914, Paul von Leto Vorbrick ordered his forces to capture a valuable sally point, thus starting the German invasion of British East Africa. Captain von Prince was commanded to take a British town called Teveda, whose position lay 25 miles from German Mashi and 75 miles from British Voi. He had at his disposal a mixed force, two companies of Askari Schutztruppen, one company of police Askari from Mashi, and a force of white European settlers. Vorbrick had been plagued with bad intel of the area from Mashi to Teveda, but he knew action was required quickly so Tibeta could not become a brace of British operations. Von Prince assigned the invading column of 300 men to be made up of a mixture of First Feld Company of the Schutztruppen and a detachment of European settlers to be commanded by Oberleutnant Boll. This column was guided by a former cavalry officer, Oberst von Brock. Von Brock had been a cavalry officer before retiring to East Africa and starting his own farm. The German attempts at reconnaissance are strangely minor, and one author describes the German-European settlers as gathering food and beer for a great picnic. Von Prince dispatched a runner to demand the surrender of Teveda on the 14th of August, but neither the runner nor the message arrived to Teveda, nor are they ever mentioned again. The only German reconnaissance recorded is a native African spying on Teveda the night before. More on that later. But the British weren't totally unprepared. The British commissioner of Tebeda, Mr. LaFontaine, was well apprised of the war in Europe on the 4th of August, and on the 5th of August was instructed by Governor Belfield on what to do. No more fraternizing with the Germans, and defenses were to be made. By the 10th of August, the town of Tebeda's Buma, a government building, had been sandbagged in key spots by LaFontaine and his 22 police Ascari. In the days leading up to the invasion, trusted runners informed him of the German settlers being armed and organized to march. When not filling sandbags, he trained his Ascaris in rifle drill and deployment. He also had one of his Ascaris deploy a cache of water in case of retreat into the Serengeti Plain towards the town of British Voy. The night before the 15th of August, a German spy was caught by La Fontaine's men. The spy, having performed reconnaissance on the British positions and defenses, he was able to escape on the morning of the 15th of August. Just as the invading German column began its march, three days after Vorbrick had ordered them to, 
This quick march was delayed at a British border post where Corporal Imuri Imwati was killed so a comrade could escape and inform Mr. LaFontaine of the invasion. Corporal Imwati is the first recorded British casualty of the invasion. By 3 a.m. in Taveda, the men rang the alarm due to gunshots being heard in the distance. The corporal's comrade arrived soon after to confirm the invasion. The survivor let Mr. LaFontaine know the Germans had changed from column into open order. Mr. LaFontaine had his men take up positions in the sandbag Boma building. At 5.30 a.m., just before dawn, Mr. LaFontaine can make out the first wave of Germans approaching the government building. He recorded some 40 troops, double that of his number. Among this first wave, atop a mule, was Herr Brocher a forester by trade now leading German forces to attack the sandbagged government building. Mr. LaFontaine leveled his 375 Webley and Scott rifle on the mule-mounted German. The morning quiet was cut short by Mr. LaFontaine shooting Herr Broker off his mule. This was followed by the British police Ascari firing their volley into the Germans approaching. In the confusion, the Germans failed to advance or cause further harm to the British. Mr. LaFontaine was able to withdraw and at the double quick marched 20 miles to Maktau without losing another man. It wasn't until the afternoon that Oberst von Brock was able to organize another assault on the undefended Boma and Herr Broker's wounds were tended to. Herr Broker died shortly after, making him the first recorded German casualty of the invasion. Taveda was the first action of the German invasion of British East Africa. While the British did withdraw, a myth of a more organized German menace raked the British papers. While the German papers celebrated the victory, but in reality, the German advance had taken three days to accomplish its initial advance, and Vorbrick in his book laments the lack of further intel gained prior to the invasion and after Taveda was captured, that his forces needed further experience and discipline. Meanwhile, the British small police force, which numerically speaking shouldn't have survived, had shown the British were more disciplined and able to follow orders. Prior to the British colonization of East Africa, the native Giriyama tribe had migrated from Somaliland to the area north of Mombasa in the 1600s. The tribe on arriving to this area was around 60,000 members and made their living selling ivory and slaves to the Arab traders along the coast. The tribe was also famed for its production of poison arrows. To commemorate this migration, a shrine called the Ke Fungo was built. Surviving the various eras of colonial rule from Oman, Portugal, Arabia, and now British, the tribe was known for evading taxes and labor demands. With the arrival of the British, these trade routes evaporated and were even illegal for the natives to be engaged in. This was made awkward by the British allowing Arab merchants in the area to still unofficially maintain a slave workforce and deal in ivory, while the British didn't allow the local tribes to do likewise, and in fact constantly taxed and required labor quotas of the local native tribes. Despite this, Germans and Girma tribes were able to trade ivory unofficially. When war erupted in East Africa, and with the German capture of Taveta, the Germans aimed to raise a native revolt inside of British-held territory. This came at the same time that Girnema's shrine south of Kilifi, the Keu Fungo, was destroyed on the 4th of August by Public Works team to get the Girnema to stop evading British authority. Both inciting events are presented by different authors, and in reality, the situation arose from a mixture of both. Conditions finally boiled over when it was found a native British East African policeman was found having relations with a Giriyama woman by the tribe. He was cut down by poison arrows on the 16th of August. On the 18th of August, a pair of native policemen of Gior's district administrator were murdered in the Mayanga Hills by a force of 150 men of mixed tribes, Giriyama and Digo. The next day, these tribesmen assaulted the Gior district commissioner's camp. Then, the rebellion tribes made another assault on the assistant district commissioner at the Gior mission on the 22nd of August. These assaults were likely an attempt to capture the weapons and supplies stored at both areas. Both these assaults were repulsed, but the situation caused the assistant district commissioner to make a call for military assistance. Again, we see the British being well-disciplined and moving quick to respond. 
Between the 23rd of August and the 27th of August, F Company of the 4th King's African Rifles and the number 1 Reserve Company of the 3rd King's African Rifles marched into the Mang Hills under the command of Major J.M.P. Hawthorne, who had assumed command of the area. On the 28th of August, the revolt attacked Hawthorne's King's African Rifles force. Around 1,000 tribesmen encountered the F Company of the 4th King's African Rifles, and after a short exchange of fire, the rebel tribesmen scattered into the brush. The encounter left 30 dead tribesmen and two wounded King's African Riflemen. They remained on station, but further combat exchanges didn't occur. By contrast, the E Company of the 1st King's African Rifles landed in the north of the Giarma territory, finding the tribe happy to greet them and not needing to engage in any military operations. While labeled as a Giamma revolt, it was in fact headed by a pair of Digo women elders. Mikatali, Menza, and Wanja Mwadori were captured and charged with inciting treason and additional witchcraft charges. Found guilty, they were exiled, sources cite being sent from the coast to either the northern border with Somalia or the western portion of the colony. The remaining Giamma tribe was made to pay a cash and livestock fine from both loyal and unloyal heads of the Giamma tribe. The exact scale and precise figures are missing from the sources. Atop that, a force of 1,000 porters to the army were to be provided. But again, sources show that these porters over time simply stopped showing up, and the British weren't punitive in response to their disappearance. The British called the loss of Taveta to the Germans and the Giamma revolt as a reason for nervousness. Governor Belfield knew that British Indian Army troops were on the way, but continued to fear further native revolts. Despite the fear-mongering, while dealing with both threats, the local commanders were able to shift resources that were needed when and where and contain both episodes. As Taveta fell to the Germans, Lieutenant Colonel Ward was deploying various forces to reinforce Maktau, Voi, and Bura to protect the Ugandan railroad that traversed British East Africa. The railroad was vital for all things travel, supply, and defense of the British colony. If something were to happen to this railroad, huge swathes of the colony would be cut off from this lifeline. In effect, the British would be isolated until railroad engineers could be informed, gathered, and then painstakingly repair the railroad. Vorbrick ordered both on the 7th of August and on the 20th of August by telegraph the commanding officers von Prince and later Schultz at Moshi not to conduct guerrilla warfare, but rather to scout the British area for further invasion. Only after the war does Vorbrick claim this was part of his famed guerrilla war strategy, but at this point he was having difficulty even communicating with the Germans occupying Taveta. While he chalks it up to white termite ants, and while this did occur, it had more to do with the local field commanders consolidating their new captured positions before trekking further into the African bush without a plan. Despite reissuing these orders on the 20th of August, the first parties were still days away from deployment. One such party was under the command of Oberleutnant von Busey. After reaching the British rail station at Marengu, von Busey found the station undefended. But rather than sending a runner back or cut the telegraph line, von Busey simply set off to wander the rail line while the telegraph line was still intact. The British locals were quick to react, reporting the Germans. On the 24th of August, 1914, a detachment from B Company 3rd King's African Rifles was sent from Voy to Marengu Station in a makeshift armored train. Finding the town unmolested, the detachment kept the cover along the railroad. It was on the morning of the 25th of August that the British detachment found the German party. Without camp guards, camping in the open, and still asleep late in the morning, the Germans were caught unprepared. Without fighting and without loss of life, the detachment surrounded the Germans and captured the party. Von Busey claimed he had been looking for a culvern to damage the Ugandan Railroad. The capture of the German party saved the British colony from being damaged. The whole event further paints the stumbling nature of the German advance into British East Africa, while the British were able to quickly react and deal with the threat professionally. While Mr. LaFontaine had been fortifying Taveda itself, British military planners had built up a pair of military bases closer to Voy. Close to Burra, Maktau was built and manned by the King's African Rifles. Meanwhile, further from Burra or Voy, 
and closest to the German captured Taveda was the East African Mechanical Transport Corps at Mboni. The unit was a mixed European Indian ethnicity of those already living in British East Africa. When war began, these volunteers in Nairobi with motorcycles were placed under the command of Lieutenant A.F. Duncan. The Europeans were volunteers with a mixture of different firearms and their own motorcycles. Some sources cite British Governor Belfield and the military planners at Nairobi felt the Indian volunteers self-named as simply the Panthans as unnecessary, but this did not deter them. Instead, many of them followed their patriotism and signed up as logistical and administrative staff for the East African Mechanical Transport Corps. They were deployed to Maktau and set up a patrol of their own at Imbwani. Unhappy with the German reconnaissance from Tabeda, von Leto Vorbrich visits Captain von Prince's position. While the performance of his troops had been less than satisfactory, he did find positives. In his words, he found von Prince fortifying Saliata Hill, eight miles further into British East Africa and the lack of communications had been addressed, with the improvised telegraph nodes being crafted from broken bottles. Von Leto Vorbrich returned to headquarters, still lacking intelligence, but happy with the enthusiastic situation. From their camp at Mbwani, the East African Mechanical Transport Corps patrolled the path for any German traffic. They had no combat exchange for 10 days and continued to carry out their mission. They were able to see the Germans fortifying Saliata Hill and were able to report it back to Nairobi. On the 25th of August, a German assault was made against the camp at Imbwani. Unlike the picture of the Great War painted of swathes of men being cut down, both sides recorded no casualties in this action. This would change four days later on the 29th of August. At 7 a.m., a patrol of three British motorcyclists heard gunshots nearby. The motorcyclist went to investigate. Scout Goodwin taking the lead and the other two following in support. The wise discipline worked out when the motorcyclist came up on Ascaris. As the motorcyclists closed to engage, a second party of Germans sprung their ambush and the German officer hit Scout Goodwin. His comrades retired to escape the ambush and report the German activity. Continuing to Mokhtau, they reported the ambush to the British base commander. Lieutenant C.G. Phillips took a strong patrol of the King's African rifles in the lorry to investigate. Following the intelligence, they were able to track the site of the ambush and confirm it with vultures circling above the tall grass which hid Scout Goodwin. Goodwin's tobacco tin had absorbed the bullet, and the crash left him concussed. Though wounded, he would make a full recover and continue to serve throughout the war. On the 3rd of September, a second German attack at Mwani was more successful, causing the men of the East African Mechanical Transport Corps to scatter into the brush with or without their motorcycles. The action in the sources fails to mention the number of kills or wounded, but now the Germans had made further gains into British East Africa and captured some motorcycles and supplies. The motorcycle patrols were later found to have mixed results. While fast and reliable, they suffered from broadcasting the location with their loud engines. The East African Mechanical Transport Corps would be relegated away from reconnaissance to transports, and the Panthans would be used to reinforce their numbers. Further reconnaissance would be carried out by other more traditional units. The Germans, meanwhile, were relying on enthusiasm and infantry tactics, which for now was paying off. With events unfolding fast, German Governor Schnee was unable to adhere to the Berlin Act of 1885. German raids were being set, forces mobilized, and blood already shed. German Governor Schnee began to give his consent to Vorbrich's already issued orders. One officer who was waiting was Hauptmann Baumstark, commanding a recruitment camp. This camp, since the beginning of hostilities, had raised four additional Schutztrupp Feld companies drawn from the mostly police Ascari across the colony, and two Schutzen Company of German-European volunteers. Vorbrich had ordered Hauptmann Baumstark to take a column to invade British East Africa and destroy Mombasa on the 20th of August. Prior to hostilities, Hauptmann Baumstark had been part of the Schutztrupp, but he had been the commanding officer of the principal recruitment depot at Dar es Salaam, a desk job. The column he had commanded had been a former police Ascari folded into the Schutztrupp on the outbreak of hostilities. Unlike other officers, Hauptmann Baumstark had waited for the governor's consent to begin hostilities, but once blessed by Governor Schnee, he would carry out a forced march over Pugu to Usambara. The column was made up of the 15th, 16th, and 17th Feld Company of the Schutztrupp. Officially raised as the number two reserve company of the 3rd 
King's African Rifles Arabs, the unit was more commonly referred to as Wavell's Arab Rifles. Raised by A.J.B. Wavell, he had himself already had a colorful career that would define most of the participants of the East African Campaign. Wavell had served in the British Army as a lieutenant in the Welsh Regiment. Wavell had made a pilgrimage to Mecca, disguised as a Zanza barbarian and imprisoned by the Turks in Yemen. He retired to Mombasa and penned his autobiography, A Modern Pilgrimage to Mecca. In Mombasa, he held high regard in the Muslim population in Mombasa. At the outbreak of war, he was able to raise a force of around 300 men, mainly of Swahilis from three locations, the bazaars at Malindi and Lamu, and also from the Mombasa jail. These freshly raised troops were armed with, and even then antique, Martini Henrys, modified to be chambered with the then modern 303 rifle cartridge. Their first assignment was to defend Mombasa alongside ex-King's African Rifle servicemen forming the number one reserve company. Although lacking in quantity and quality, this force was never challenged in those opening days. To the south of Mombasa was a network of motor vehicle sized roads from Mombasa to Ghazi, and a simple walking path from Ghazi to Venga. Venga lay on the south bank of the Umba River, and consisted of a dock, customs house, and other buildings. At Venga, at the outbreak of war, District Commissioner Ainsworth Dixon put his customs house into a state of defense much like that of La Fontaine's custom house in Taveta. Dixon also made use of intelligence reports and watching German movements. He was aided in this effort by the local Zanzibar appointed governor, Liwali bin Ali. He was also loyal to the British and was critical in organizing the Muslim population to aid the British for the duration of the war, just as well as documents and reports were circulating the various Muslim population that the British had lost to Veda and that they should rise up against the British. Hauptmann Baumstark, not taking the same steps as Dixon, failed to use his numerical superiority to dominate his opponent, instead raising a new camp at Kibirul and sending token defense forces to the German-bordered village of Jazen. This build-up was being watched by the British and reported back to Mombasa. Dixon thought this concentration of hundreds of trained German Ascaris so close to his post was a prelude to invasion, like that found at Taveta. Reporting this to Nairobi, Colonel Ward wanted to reinforce the area with the newly raised units in Mombasa, so the Germans wouldn't be able to assault or sabotage the vital Mombasa port. Dispatching the number one reserve company from Mombasa and the Zanzibar garrison from Zanzibar on the 21st of August via the sea, were routed to Venga. Arriving, they deployed and waited for the German invasion, which never materialized, as the Germans were busy building their camp. The next day, the Zanzibar garrison redeployed to Zanzibar. Sources don't say, but at some point, the number one reserve company was replaced by the number two reserve company, Wavell's Arabs. Marching from Mombasa to Venga, arriving on the same day that Dixon reported again alarm, after his police escort watched an additional German patrol arriving to Jensen. In reality, it was a patrol to relieve that day's defenders at Jensen. Nonetheless, Wavell and the other officers found Venga simply too far and reliant on naval redeployment. Further, having just marched overland, the distance was compounded by the town being on the south side of a river. Should the town be put to siege, it would be difficult to relieve the defenders. One source reminds the readers that being so close to so many water features, Mosquitoes and malaria would also be obstacles to defense. Dixon and his staff were to relocate to the north, away from the water feature choke points, but still in the district. The Zanzibar garrison would again return to Zanzibar. As all this got underway, Wavell and his Arabs on the 30th of August invaded German East Africa. First moving on Jansen to deal with a supposed German buildup, a quick volley from their antique Martini Henrys put the German patrol based at the village to flee. Seeing such a smaller force scatter, Wavell took his men to Kibiru. There, the Germans had taken up defense and prepared to finally endure the coming British invasion. Wavell instead used his machine guns to make a demonstration against the numerically superior Germans. Having rattled the Germans, Wavell was able to withdraw back to Venga. 
where, that evening, he organized the last of the evacuation before withdrawing to Majoni. On the 30th of August, Hauptmann Baumstark, having endured the British invasion and being rattled, went to Vanga. Finding the village deserted of all life and stores, he ordered the British Customs House and the Zanzibari Liwali's home blown up. Then, he returned to Kibiru, where he was reinforced with two newly raised units. 4th Schutzen Company, German settler volunteer soldiers, and the German Arab Corps. The German Arab Corps, in contrast to Wavell's Arab Rifles, was headed up by the son of a British exiled slave trader, C.B. bin Imbark. This German Arab Corps was only 50 members in this early stage, but would grow from an initial size of 50 to 400 members, twice the size of a pre-war German Ascari company. This force was noted for its command harboring strange romantic practices with younger males. It would also take Hauptmann Baumstark another two weeks till he discovered the Vanga inhabitants had relocated to Majoni. Despite Vorbrick calling his officers to make bold attacks into British East Africa from headquarters in Numashi and British authors painting Mombasa defenseless to his assaults, in the field it was much more complex. Hauptmann Baumstark didn't see the value in charging at Mombasa through mosquito-infested water features to be cut off by the British Royal Navy, or worse, leaving Tanga completely vulnerable. That, and he still didn't know the British strength. What his men had endured had caused them to scatter or hunker down. Until something fortuitous changed, he made the correct call to wait. Despite many of the Germans engaging in attempted random raids and failed sabotage, one German officer was actually carrying out Vorbrick's wishes of gathering intelligence. Lieutenant von Oppen of the 13th Feldkompany Schutztrupp had set out from Himo and was finding a path for future operations in the Imzima Springs area. Unlike his peers, he didn't try to single-handedly bomb the Ugun Railroad with a small party, but he and his men weren't alone. Lieutenant H. H. Davies' Abyssinian Company of the 3rd King's African Rifles had been commanding a party of mounted infantry sweeping the Mzima Springs area for German activity, guided by a party of Maasai scouts. They had been on patrol for a week and were moving through the difficult terrain when Von Open laid an ambush. Firing through the grass, Davies' men were caught off guard. Not knowing where the shooting was coming from, the British mounted soldiers and their guides withdrew. Lieutenant Von Open was able to withdraw as well. While the attack didn't make the British leave the area, it was deemed untenable due to the litany of factors. The thick thornbrush wore on the forces down over time. Testy flies were rampant among the mounts being used by the British. Thirdly, the Maasai guides wanted to retire back to their homes, seeing the British retreat from a German attack. For the remainder of the campaign, the Maasai would support sides with guides, porters, with selling materials, and Vorbrick recalls an English Maasai say, it is all the same to us whether the English or the Germans are our masters. Despite falling back, the British African Distinguished Conduct Medal was awarded to Gazal Waldi Miram, having already earned the award in the pre-war era. His award was given a bar. The defense of the area was rearranged to be taken up by B Company of the First King's African Rifles, under Lieutenant R.C. Hardingham, building a post at Marabu and patrolling the Mzima area. Reporting back that the British forces were sparse and quick to flight, Lieutenant von Oppen unlike his peers, completed his mission. With his intelligence, the next thrust was planned on the 3rd of September. 13th Feldkompany's commanding officer, Hauptmann Schultz, took a column of the 1st and 13th Feldkompany, a force of around 220 men and four heavy machine guns, to attack the Tesevo River Bridge of the Ugandan Railroad. 